Hello, everyone, and welcome to Origin and Causes uh, webinar, ARC Mapping Down to the Wire. Just wanted to uh, first start off by saying I hope you and your families are in, in good health and in safety. Um, and uh, I'm seeing that there's quite a bit of uh, laxing of procedures and protocols in, in various provinces and, and different communities. So it's, it's uh, great to hear people are getting better and better. I just want to go through a few things with you guys uh, first before we jump into the content. Uh, first of all, I'm George Costandi, the moderator today for the webinar. And uh, we'll be doing a live Q&A at the end of the webinar. So please feel free to submit your questions in the text box under the webinar screen. We'll be trying to get to as many questions as possible within the hour. If we don't get to your question in the webinar, we promise to follow up with you after the fact to make sure your question has been answered. All questions will be anonymously addressed. Um, so it, if you do want to be uh, get a shout out, just put your name, your company name, and your question, and, and we'll give you that shout out. A disclaimer, all information discussed in this webinar is for educational purposes only and should not be applied directly to the administration of any particular file or claim. Uh, if you have any questions based on the topic that is covered today and how it relates to a file of yours, please let us know. Give us a shout and we'll be sure to help you. The webinar is being recorded and will be posted on our website, on LinkedIn and YouTube pages. So please feel free to pass them on to your colleagues or use them in your team meetings if you wish. We'll be sending out completion certificates uh, a few days out after the, the, uh, the webinar by email. And at the end of the webinar, when you close the GoToWebinar window, the program will prompt you to answer a few questions about the webinar. And we'd love to hear your feedback, to rank the speakers, the content, and, and everything at the end. Uh, if you're experiencing any technical difficulties, you can email our team questions at webinar at origin-and-cause.com. Okay, let's get started. So I'd like to introduce our speaker, uh, Vladimir Klistovsky, also known as Val. Uh, Val is the manager of our Mississauga office in Ontario. Uh, and he actually is one of the co-authors of the book, The Lawyer's Guide to the Forensic Sciences. He, he wrote the chapter on fire investigation, which is chapter 10. His specialties include fires and explosion investigations, commercial and industrial machinery, equip, equipment and buildings, product quality, product design and production. Uh, he's a board member and past national president of the Canadian Association of, of Fire Investigators. He's currently the training director of CAFI and also assists in the Standard Council of Canada as a designated expert in their certifying body and laboratory accreditation programs. So without further ado, I'll pass off the mic to Val and we'll get we'll jump right into the topic. Well, thank you, George. And thank you everyone for uh, coming on and, and joining our webinar. So uh, a bit of a scope of our webinar, I'll do a quick introduction on arc mapping and then we're gonna step back a little bit and we're gonna look at the investigation methodology uh, origin and cause, origin versus cause, and the four areas of information for determining the origin of the fire. And that's what we're going to focus on in this webinar and how arc mapping assists us in determining the origin of the fire. And then we'll do some case studies and, and see how we can apply what we learned in the webinar. So first of all, what, what's an electrical arc or what's arc mapping? So in this photograph, you can see two wires and a kind of a bright light uh, in between the wires. And I'm sure many of you have seen wires cross and cause sparks and a bright light. And um, 
it's a tremendous amount of heat that comes off electrical arcing, especially in the, the voltage in, in house wiring. And uh, just to be clear, when we're doing arc mapping in a fire scene, we're not looking for these sparks and these bright lights and and heat. What we're looking for is the damage that's caused on the wires from these electrical arcing events that happened uh, during the fire um, when the fire attacked those electrical circuits. And what does that look like? Well, the, the effects of electrical, electrical arcing, um, there's, I've listed four here, and we can see all four in this, in this photograph here. So arc beads are all these little nodules, these little beads on the surfaces of the wires. Arc globules are these big balls of molten copper on the ends of the wires. Then we've got arc severing as well. So this used to be four wires. These two wires used to connect to these two wires up here. And we have localized loss of material. So this is what happens. This is the kind of damage that occurs when fire attacks uh, a house electrical circuit. Um, and this is what results. This is what we're looking for when we're doing arc mapping. Okay, so let's step back a little bit and uh, go back to basics a little bit, and then we'll show you how uh, arc mapping becomes useful in, in our investigation. So uh, in general, the origin is the general location of where the fire explosion began. And when, as fire investigators, we talk about the area of origin, that's really the structure, part of a structure, a general geographic location within the scene. Um, in which the point of origin of a fire explosion is reasonably believed to be located in. Now that's the definition from NFPA 921, which is the guide for fire and explosion investigations. And that's really the national guide or international guide for fire investigators. That's what you study to become a fire investigator. Uh, so the point of origin of the fire is actually the exact physical location within the area of origin where the heat source and the fuel interacted, which resulting in a fire or explosion. And it is within that point of origin that we would expect to find the cause of the fire. So you can imagine that finding the origin of the fire, even before we think about cause, finding the origin of the fire is the most important, uh, the, the most important thing that a fire investigator must do because if the investigator doesn't identify the correct origin of the fire, he's not gonna find the cause in that origin. And according to NFPA 921, in, a, in a almost all causes, if the origin cannot be determined, then the cause cannot be determined. And because the cause will typically be located in the fire origin area, I'll again stress that the finding of the correct origin of the fire is the most important job for the investigator. So how do we find the origin of the fire? Well, there are four sources of information that we use to find the origin. So witness information is the analysis of the observations reported by the persons who witnessed the fire or were aware of the conditions present at the, fire, at the time of the fire. Now this can be by direct observations of the witnesses or it could be by closed caption camera footage that, that recorded the, the first uh, parts of the fire. Uh, number two is fire patterns, which is the analysis of the effects of the patterns left by the fire. Arc mapping, which we're gonna see a little bit more about, which is the analysis of the locations where electrical arcing has caused damage and the documentations of those involved electrical circuits. And finally, fire dynamics. Now, fire dynamics is one of those things that you start using or that you take more heed of when you're a more uh, experienced fire investigator, and that is the physics and chemistry of the fire initiation and growth and the interaction between the fire and the building systems. And we'll see a little bit more about that in, in, in the next couple of slides. Okay, so fire patterns. So uh, in this photograph, you can see that we have 
uh, a fire scene, we've got a lot of damage at the base of the door. And these are really fire patterns that we're looking at. So uh, I've drawn these two red lines, which indicate a V fire pattern, which is one of the more common fire patterns that we see in a fire scene. Uh, there are actually more than 80 different defined fire patterns that as fire investigators, we have to be aware of and uh, consider in a fire scene. But here, here's the most common one. So in this case, uh, if this is the only V pattern or the only pattern in this room, we would probably conclude that the fire started at the base of this door. Okay, what about this one here? So here we've got another V fire pattern. I, I didn't draw the lines uh, on this photograph, but you can see that we've got the one side of the V here. We've got the other side of the V here, but it's, it's kind of masked because it that door was probably open during the fire scene, so that V is kind of hidden to us. But in this case, we can sort of imagine the other side of the V, and that's pointing down towards that couch as being the origin of the fire, or at least a an origin or a fuel package. If there's more fire patterns in this room, then we would consider those as well as being the origin, and maybe this was just uh, some... Uh, combustibles that caught fire during the fire and caused this fire pattern. Now, fire dynamics. So, as I mentioned earlier, is the science of how fire start, spread, and develop. And it's also the interaction of the fire and the environment that it's in. Uh, it could also be the fuel load, the size, shape, and construction of a, of a room, and the ventilation. So, in this photograph, we've actually determined that the origin of the fire was at, at the thimble at the top of the wood stove over here. Now, when you look at all the damage in the photograph, you see that there's there's not a whole lot of damage in this area. There appears to be more damage at the building opening or the door opening to the outside here and, and at the window opening. Now, that's as, as a result of ventilation. So ventilation is one of those fire dynamic or fire dynamics items that you have to consider in a fire scene when when looking at fire patterns. Ventilation will cause greater damage around those openings or around the openings where air entrainment um, is and will cause the fire to burn more intensely. So the next uh, sequence of slides, I'll actually show the effects of fire propagation, which is how the fire grows and spreads, and what the formation of fire patterns looks like. So you also see a room with full room involvement. So again, these illustrations are from NFPA 921, the Guide for Fire and Explosion Investigations. Again, the uh, our guide as fire investigators. So uh, we look at a room, this, this is just a simple depiction of a room. We have a fire that starts on the upholstered chair. And in the early stages of the fire, we, ha we have uh, what's called a fuel controlled fire. The fire uh, grows and is controlled by the amount of fuel available to the fire uh, because we assume we have plenty of air for that fire to burn. And the, what I mean by fuel is all these combustibles, the chairs and, and tables and other combustibles in the room. So in the early stages of fire development, you, you have the combustibles burning and you have these hot gases generated. And these hot gases, just due to buoyancy, they rise to the ceiling level and they'll collect at the ceiling level. And as they hit obstructions, that ceiling layer is going to continue to grow and descend in the room. And you may uh, lose some of that ceiling layer to other areas uh, of the building uh, through openings, but it's, it's that uh, origin room where that ceiling layer is going to continue to grow until the fire is either cooled or, or, or extinguished. So this next slide just shows the descending of, of that hot ceiling gas layer, the fire is continuing to build and we have air entrainment into the room which assists in the combustion of the fire 
And as that fire burns, that ceiling layer is going to gain in energy. The amount of heat energy is going to increase in that hot ceiling layer. And as that continues, um, that hot ceiling gas layer is going to descend and it's going to radiate heat down to all our other combustibles. Again, that's the furniture in the room. And as that radiant heat increases, the temperature of all our combustibles, there's going to be a point in time where all of those combustibles are going to go on fire. They're going to reach their ignition temperature and everything is going to start to burn. So this is what we call full room involvement, where everything in the fire burns. Some people call this transition, they call it a, a room with a fire transitioning to a room on fire. And we're still going to continue airflow into the room, but the amount of smoke and heat exiting the room is going to start to make this fire a ventilation controlled fire. So the fire is actually controlled, the intensity of the fire is controlled by the amount of ventilation or the air or oxygen inflowing into the room. And at some point, the amount of oxygen entering that room is not going to be sufficient to sustain all our combustibles burning, and they'll actually self-extinguish. Now, if someone to, were to open a room in this, sorry, open a uh, window in this room, uh, all these combustibles will start to burn again because they'll have the three parts of the fire triangle again to continue the burn. But you can imagine that a fire. Uh, let's say the fire department extinguished the fire at this point, all of our fire patterns are really masked. If we go back to our initial slide here and let's say fire department came in and put the fire out at this point, we would have this kind of a V fire pattern. We would also have just the localized damage to the chair. So we'll be able to tell where the origin of the fire is. But if you can imagine a fire here, and the fire department arrives at some point during this fire and extinguishes the fire, we don't have a whole lot of fire patterns to go on. Um, the fire started on this chair, continued to the table. It's burning on this chair now. All of these combustibles will form various different patterns on the walls and ceilings, making it difficult for us, based on fire patterns alone, to determine the origin of the fire. So as fire investigators, we have to have some other tools in our tool belt. And I'll show you a photograph. Um, this is actually a photo of a room that's gone through flashover or, or full room involvement. So you can see physically all of the combustibles or most of the combustibles in the room have been consumed by the fire. All that's left is kind of the non-combustible construction, the steel furniture. There's a bit of combustibles here that were protected during the fire, but you can see there's really no fire patterns on the wall. The ceiling's gone. So how would we investigate a fire in a room like this? We don't really know where the fire origin is, and fire patterns don't really assist us too much. So this is where arc mapping may, may be able to, to assist us. So the, the official uh, NFPA 921 definition of arc mapping is quite the mouthful, but really uh, arc mapping is the use of the locations of arcing in the room where the fire happened, like using them like a map to help us find the origin of the fire. And this is based on the predictable behavior of the electrical wiring that's exposed to a spreading fire. The exposed electrical circuits will burn and cause arcing damage in the room or in the progression of the fire, and that's going to leave behind sort of a map of where those electrical location, electrical arcing locations happen that will assist sort of like a, a fire pattern, but it's going to be more of a arcing uh, arc map pattern that's going to assist us in determining the origin. So this this next slide, it may be a little confusing at first. The Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, Firearms, and Explosive is the federal agency in the United States that conducts uh, fire investigations under national, uh, at a national level. And the the ATF, short for the short form, um, 
has a lot of money to do experimentation and, and to burn, to have fuel cells and to illustrate how fire progresses and teach their investigators how to investigate fire. So this, this uh, map that I'm showing you here is a burn test cell used to illustrate the usefulness of arc mapping. So this test cell, it's a, uh, uh, it's a top view. We're looking down into a room that's outfitted like a living room. We've got a couch against this wall here. We've got a, uh, a side table. We've got a coffee table. And what they did was they outfitted the room at the ceiling level with a grid of electrical conductors or electrical cables. And this grid, each each one of these lines in the grid are an individual energized electrical cable that's protected by a circuit breaker. And these little squares at the bottom are the circuit breakers for each of those cables. Now, just to go back a bit, rooms are not typically wired in grid patterns. Uh, rooms are wired through the walls and they're wired through the ceilings, the ceiling fixtures. So this is an unrealistic wiring of a room. And again, I'll stress it is used for the uh, illustration of the usefulness of arc mapping. Now you'll notice that there's these red dots on the wires and these red dots indicate the points where electrical arcing occurred on these wires when the ATF set a fire on the couch in this area marked by the blue circle. So this is a test. They outfitted this room, they set a fire on the couch and they watched as the fire grew in the room and attacked all these electrical circuits. So these red dots are the after effects after the fire has been extinguished and all the breakers tripped. So how do, you, how do we use that as a pattern? So if you can see all the sort of east-west circuits, which are marked in green, all kind of arc through the center of the room and that circle with the with the green ellipse and all the uh, east-west circuits, sorry, the north-south circuits, which are marked in blue, all arc around this quadrant of the room, circled by the blue ellipse. And if you take the intersection of the two ellipses, like a Venn diagram, you can see that the origin of the fire is actually located within this small area uh, signified by the red circle here. So without even looking at fire patterns after the fire set in this room, you can see that we've just narrowed our origin area of the fire to about 10% of the room in this area. So you can imagine that trying to find a cause, after we've determined the origin, trying to find a cause in this room has just been simplified by using arc mapping and has limited it to about 10% of the room rather than trying to find a cause in the whole room. Okay, so hopefully everybody kind of understands that. Let's look at a couple of case studies and, and see how we can apply um, arc mapping to our uh, case studies. So this is a barn um, uh, where a fire occurred. There were no witnesses to provide information of where they saw the fire uh, occur uh, during the first stages of the fire. And we can see that the fire probably started somewhere at the back of the photograph near where the windows are. And uh, there's less fire damage where I'm standing taking the picture. And the fire, as the fire progressed, some of those hot gases kind of came out and damaged the ceiling in this upper area. Now, prior to me attending this fire scene, the fire department um, attended and they did their own fire investigation. And they concluded that uh, based on fire patterns that this fire started on this riding lawnmower. And initially looking at it, I'd say, yeah, the, I mean, that looks like an origin. The, we've got some low burning on the wall here as a fire pattern as a result of the burning on this uh, lawnmower. Uh, we've got the, the fuel of the, uh, the seat cushion and we've got fuels within the lawnmower and 
there's probably a battery that starts the lawnmower, so potential ignition source is there. So it is a potential fire origin. Here's another look. Here's this, here's the rider lawnmower. And here's sort of a V fire pattern showing, uh, pointing down to the seat and the sort of engine compartment on that lawnmower. So, you know, um, we do have a distinct burn area and possible origin area. Now, looking at this picture, we also see we've got electrical wiring through the ceiling. So later on, we're going to use that wiring to help us in doing an arc mapping survey to see whether this is actually the origin of the fire. Now, another thing I see in this photograph is we have another area of low burning, and that's this area above the fuel oil tank. Looks like we had some burning coming from behind the fuel oil tank and kind of going up to the ceiling here. So uh, let's take a closer look at that. So we see we're at the top of the fuel oil tank here. And we see that there's an actual armored cable that comes up the wall and uh, comes up to the ceiling level. And if we have a close look where that wire met the ceiling, we see the photograph that we looked at before showing all the evidence of electrical arcing activity to the cable. So we have an area of electrical arcing activity, which uh, is potentially near the origin of the fire. And um, during our fire scene investigation and our, our arc mapping survey, we typically will look at the electrical panel. And incidentally, in this case, the electrical panel had only one trip to breaker and tracing of the wiring within the origin area, the wiring that I showed you in the previous photographs, there was only one breaker protecting that wiring and that was tripped. So that's telling me that the fire likely attacked the wiring and that as a result of the breaker tripped because we had electrical arcing activity and this was the only electrical arcing activity, incidentally, that I found on the wiring in this barn, which has again given me that level of confidence that um, I am probably near the origin of the fire for this uh, for this fire scene. So let's have a look down. Let's continue looking at the what this cable is feeding. And we look down, that's the cable, and it's actually feeding a junction box that used to contain, I believe, an electrical receptacle, but the junction box is open. So there's been some something going on here. Somebody's been doing some wiring, and there's this little device that's connected to it that doesn't look familiar. So we take a closer look, and we remove that device, and that device was actually a, it's, it's, what we call a clamshell uh, receptacle. This is something, and it's hard to see in the photograph, but it's it's really a, a male and a female plug, and that's something that you would buy at a hardware store to fix an extension cord. So what you would do is, if your extension cord had damage on the uh, male or female plug, you would cut that part of the cord off, and then you'd apply this clamshell plug, and you you have a good extension cord again but it's not really meant for permanent wiring in, in house and industrial wiring. So somebody wired it into a junction box here and thought that was a good idea. Now, what I'm also seeing here is this localized fire damage, which is indic indicative of electrical failure, probably from uh, a poor connection or res resistive connection. So now stepping back a bit, so how did arc mapping help us in this case? Well, arc mapping assisted us in looking at the two potential origin areas and determining that this is the more likely origin area rather than that rider lawnmower where the fire department determined was their origin area. So if we didn't find this origin area here, we'd probably still be looking at that lawnmower and thinking, well, what failed on that lawnmower or what, you know, what, what caused the fire or what, what in that lawnmower possibly could have burned to or started, started that fire. But arc mapping actually allowed us to eliminate that or potential origin area and find this 
origin area. Okay, so let's have another look. Uh, let's do another case study, see how we can apply that. So this is a bedroom which had a fire in it. And this, uh, again, is after the fire department has attended and has extinguished the fire, but has also done a little bit of overhaul. Uh, so overhaul, for those people that aren't familiar with that term, is the fire department will move contents. Um, they'll sort of toss the room because they're trying to get at all the parts of the room that are burning so that they can actually extinguish all parts of the room so that they don't have a reignition or, or a rekindle. So a lot of the contents were moved. The room probably looked a little bit different than, uh, uh, than this prior to the fire. Um, but let's 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 have a look. So this is a, another view looking at different parts of the room. Actually, let's have a look over here. We can see a, a low burn kind of behind the mattress, and we can see some consumption of the mattress here. So it looks like uh, we've got some fire patterns on the ceiling, and we've got some fire pattern, fire patterns on that wall there. This is another look we're looking at. Uh, the mattress is located on this side, so we're looking at the end of that room with the door, and we're seeing there the fire patterns are kind of higher up in the room on this side. So probably uh, fire origin is not on this side of the room. We're thinking maybe on that side. And as we look at a different part of the room, so here I'm standing at that mattress and looking towards the entrance into the room. That's the entrance door. And we can see that, again, our fire patterns are kind of high up. So not thinking that the origin of the fire is at the entrance of the room. And we also see that the room is finished. It's a framed room and it's finished in plywood uh, paneling, which is not so common anymore, but this is an older type building. So plywood paneling, it, it burns a lot easier. And for our benefit, actually, the plywood paneling will burn away uh, pretty quickly, which will expose the wiring in the walls for us to to uh, cause electrical arcing to begin, which will allow us to do an arc mapping survey. Okay, so moving on. Um, during the fire investigation, we'll typically clean out the room, we'll expose the floor, and we'll do a fire scene reconstruction. So what that means is we'll put all the items that were in the room prior to the fire back in place to see what kind of fire patterns we get, first of all, on the walls, and on the floor, and then on the, on, the, on the room of origin contents. Now, right away we start seeing that there's, there's this low fire pattern on this wall where that mattress was in, in the previous photograph and we have sort of a V. We've got a wide V fire pattern, probably six to eight feet wide. So we've got an origin area just based on fire patterns that's about six feet wide and call it five or six feet deep into the room. And we also take note that that plywood paneling did burn away. We can see the little bits and pieces on either side of that V and that exposed our electrical wiring. We've got three circuits in the wall here, indicated by the yellow arrows. And here we have an electrical receptacle right in the middle of our V fire pattern. So that becomes sort of a potential cause that we consider. We take a closer look at that electrical receptacle and it's not that damaged actually. So it doesn't look like we've got a fire starting at the receptacle, or at least in the receptacle. We might have a fire starting with something that's plugged in. But even then, uh, we've got a bit of the wall plate left. And examination of the wiring inside of the receptacle, again, doesn't show any arcing. So that's telling us we didn't really have a failure here. So we start looking uh, at other contents. We start putting the contents back in place. And um, so our friendly fire chief helps us to put the mattress in place. Uh, here's the box spring. The box spring has a burn pattern in it, actually two of them, one at the back here, one over here. And that's kind of matching our burn pattern on the wall. And again, the arrows pointing to the electrical receptacle just as a reference point uh, for us to know where we're in the room. 
And as we put the remains of the mattress on the box spring, this is where we get, and we put the bed in the corner where it was prior to the fire, and we do that sort of fire department reported that the bed was in the corner, but also we can see that the fire patterns kind of line up with the bed being in the corner. Again, here's our receptacle for reference purposes, and you can just barely see that box spring mattress showing that burn pattern there. So our burn patterns or our fire patterns are kind of matching up, but still kind of wide. So we, we keep looking, we put back some of the contents that were ahead of the bed back in place after uh, looking at those contents after excavation. We had some power cords, some, some of these extension cords are outside the origin area, there's no fire damage to them. We've got the remains of a floor fan or what we call a floor standing oscillating fan. There's a cage for it, there's a stand for it. And then we've got this little piece of burnt plastic debris. So we take a closer look at that. There's some wires in it, possibly some power cords. And we later determined that, that this is one of those uh, plastic shelving units or plastic drawer units that you would buy at Walmart and put towels or, or such items. To, this one was full of wires and electronic components. So we continue our arc mapping survey. Uh, First, first step in an arc mapping survey is to document the electrical panel. In this case, it's a fuse panel. Um, the fuse panel was in the kitchen adjacent to that bedroom, so it's it's not too far. So that allows us to do a good arc map, sorry, arc uh, um, wire tracing. So we document the electrical panel. In this case, we use a multimeter to check the continuity in each one of those fuses, and what we find. After drawing uh, the fuse panel on our, on our notepad, and we put check marks where our multimeter checks that the fuse is okay. The X's indicate where the fuse is tripped. So we find that we had three circuits that tripped during the fire. Using our index and actually tracing some of those circuits back to the bedroom, we find that circuit number five was destined for the bath and bedroom. Circuit number six was kitchen lights, but also powered the lights in the bedroom. And circuit number eight was for the hot water tank. So being good fire investigators, we, we draw a diagram of the room of origin. Uh, this is the room of origin here. And on that room of origin, we placed the contents, we placed the bed, and we placed that the cross is actually the, uh, the base of that fan. And I've taken the liberty of this cloud pattern here is the origin based on my fire patterns alone. So that was that V pattern. So I'm saying origin of my fire is probably within this area. Now on the diagram, we also put how our circuits are wired. And because the circuits are, uh, the branch circuits are exposed, it's, it's fairly easy to trace them. So here's our three circuits. This bottom one's for the water heater. And this upper one is for the bedroom electrical receptacle, uh, two receptacles and the bathroom. And then we've got the third circuit here that comes from the kitchen and powers a ceiling light and the, another ceiling light in the bedroom. Now, the, the red X's we mark is where we find locations of arcing. So that those damage, uh, the damage to the conductors from electrical arcing, and you can see that these two are actually within our origin area and that they uh, actually correspond with our origin area. This one's kind of outside our origin area. And uh, why would that be? Well, really, this circuit doesn't go through our origin area and this circuit's wired high in the ceiling. So really what happened here is once that fire started to build and you, you can recall the, the hot ceiling layer, hot ceiling gas layer, it attacked that circuit at the ceiling light level. So again, using that fire dynamics, we, we realized that this is arcing that happened later in the fire and these two happened earlier in the fire. So what does that look like? So typically during my arc mapping survey, I'll mark the locations of arcing with an orange ribbon. So in this case, you can see that my orange ribbons, the two areas of arcing in this wall, 
that's marked on this diagram are actually one above the other and above that electrical receptacle and above the edge of that bed. So that's really telling me or it's narrowing down that origin of the fire from something that's about six feet wide to about a foot wide. It's telling me that the fire probably started in this area. If the fire started here where you see that cage, that ribbon would be over here or that ribbon, that electrical arcing marked by the ribbon. So what does that arcing look like? So here's our orange ribbon where I marked the location of arcing. So you can see the arc locations. These two wires came together and caused electrical arcing and that damage is left behind on the wires. Here's the, the other one uh, on the other electrical circuit. You can see the loss of material on this wire and some of that arcing, the, the arc beads right there. So now we have to look at that piece of debris that we looked at earlier and look at those wires. So doing a quick look at the wires, didn't find any electrical arcing activity on those wires. So, but some of those wires are buried deep inside the plastic mass. So we keep looking and what we find is within that plastic mass, we see that motor from that fan. And because there's still a lot of plastic left on it and we look at the wires, there's no arcing. We develop a bit of a confidence that that fan probably didn't cause the fire, but we still keep that as a possibility. And we look at the power cord for that fan, uh, no evidence of arcing, the plug blades look pretty decent. So again, raising that level of confidence of, of us thinking that that fire didn't start with that fan. So what do we have? Later the occupant reported to us that he didn't smoke in the bedroom, he only smoked in the living room. Um, that the items in the plastic storage unit near the bed were a CB radio and miscellaneous cords, wires, electrical components that he had stored in there. They weren't plugged in, so um, items in that cabinet can probably be eliminated. And then we've got items that were plugged into that receptacle near the bed was a clock radio and the oscillating fan. Now we didn't see the clock radio, it was probably consumed in the fire. Um, so what do we have now? Now we, we've narrowed our origin area and we start considering causes. So what are potential causes? Now cause determination is a process of elimination. We have to consider all the reasonable causes and then start eliminating them. So smoker's materials, I think it's still possible the guy's a smoker and even though he didn't say he smoked in the bedroom, we still have to consider that as a possibility. Candles, not likely. Uh, I didn't find any other candles in the room. So I'd say, uh, and he didn't mention that there were any candles burning. So I'd say we can reasonably eliminate that. Extension cords, not likely outside of the orange, origin area and no damage to them. Plugged in appliances, electrical items. It's possible, but not likely. Again, um, we, we continue, we want to eliminate those appliances altogether. So later on, we, we take these uh, pieces back to our lab, shoot some x-rays through them. This is that CB radio that's located in that, uh, in that plastic storage unit. And it, it's pretty intact. There's no evidence of uh, localized damage and then all the circuits appeared uh, in their place. So pretty quick. Uh, look at that, tells me that we can eliminate the CB radio. Now, we did find the clock radio. That's the remains of that clock radio. Again, looking at it, I don't see any splatter. All the circuits are in their places for the most part. There's no arcing on the wires, which would be shown by um, uh, beads, uh, dark beads on the wires. So, uh, based on the look, based on a viewing of the x-ray I could say that we eliminated that that clock radio and here's two views of the electrical motor so um, we can see the windings in the motor we can see the bearings and we can see the wiring again no evidence of failure so after all that uh, looking at the x-rays we can go back and say what are our reasonable causes based on the elimination of the causes that we uh, were considering 
and the only cause that we cannot eliminate is smokers' materials. Now, this case study doesn't highlight arc mapping as well as the other case study or, or a case study that I could have shown in a room with full room involvement, but you can see how arc mapping can assist us in determining the origin of the fire. Um, now, um, I don't have any more case studies to show you, so this concludes my uh, presentation. Uh, I welcome everybody to submit some questions if you have, have those. Um, actually, let's discuss a little bit about the limitations of arc mapping. Um, there are some limitations, and uh, in, in summary, you can also use arc mapping to uh, in appliances and in vehicles in the same sort of manner as, as I showed you in this in this uh, in the room. And some of the limitations are that wiring located be behind thermal barriers such as drywall. So if some of these areas were covered in drywall, it's going to take longer for that fire to penetrate that drywall and cause arcing in to those wires behind the drywall. So arc mapping is not going to be as useful. And the wiring only passes through certain areas of buildings. So if, if you have an origin of the fire where there's no building wiring, that's going to, again, uh, reduce that usefulness of arc mapping. And complete destruction of branch circuits, melting, or collapse of the building structure is also going to limit your ability to do arc mapping because those circuits are not going to be in their original places, they might be in pieces, and, and if you have building collapse, it's, it may be in a different place. And backup generators and people energizing breakers after the fire is going to make uh, cause arcing in other areas on the wires, which again is going to impact your arc mapping exercise. And I'm going to stress that the value of the information from arc mapping is directly dependent on the accuracy and the effort of the uh, fire investigator correctly identifying the arc sites. Okay, so I realize we don't have a lot of time, so I'll quickly go to the question uh, part of our, our webinar. So, uh, George, I'll leave that to you. You've Thank you some... very much, Val. Appreciate it. Um, yeah, so uh, guys, please submit your questions uh, in the questions tab um, in the GoToWebinar panel there. Um, we have questions coming in and we'll jump right into it. So, got a question uh, that's asking, would fire resistive ceiling tiles help uh, like the, the, the fire infiltration and damaging of the wires? Uh, when you say help, um, I think you mean how long is the fire going to take to burn through the fire resistive ceiling tiles? And so there's several types of ceiling tiles. There's the ones that are kind of the 12 by 12, which are on a grid. Those are probably going to take a little longer to burn. And then there's the uh, T-bar ceilings, which uh, fire will typically cause those to drop out of the ceiling and expose that wiring. So, so yes, um, more in the T-bar ceilings, the two foot by four foot tiles that drop out of the ceiling, you'll probably have that happen earlier in the fire and exposing the wires in the ceiling, which will prov probably provide better a better go at arc mapping. Hopefully that answers that question. Cool. Uh, on case study one, can you give a quick overview on the first fuel ignited and the fire spread from the plug to the other areas of the barn? Okay, so I'll go to that case study. So first fuel ignited in this case is that clamshell plug. So you can see um, the part of the plug at the other at, at the one end is all intact. This is probably what it would look like. It's got a little bit of heat damage, but it's yellow, and it would look similar to the other side here. But here you can see that it's actually um, it's actually pretty burnt away. And so this is the first fuel. Now, it does look like a pretty limited fuel. So how does fire spread from, from this area? Um, after, that there were some other combustibles that were actually sitting there on the oil tank that dropped afterwards. So uh, 
this being the first fuel, I think the immediate second fuel would have been located on that uh, fuel tank, which uh, there were some some parts and components and you know typical stuff you'd find in a barn where somebody's doing maintenance. So I think that's how the fire spread from this area. It uh, first fuel here, second fuel on the on the tank, and and then up to the ceiling, burning the ceiling away. And the ceiling had uh, some of the plywood paneling on it. Another question's come in saying, so is it safe to assume the debris fell on the lawnmower and caused the damage? That's so uh, believe, that's another good theory. Um, yeah. So uh, I believe you had mentioned there was stuff on the lawnmower. Was that right? Yes. Yes, I did. So again, um, this is the lawnmower after the fire department put the fire out. There were some actually automotive uh, fiberglass items that were placed on the lawnmower and as the lawnmower was stored in the area. So I think those were a couple of other items that burnt there and that caused these patterns to happen. And again, um, these fire patterns, like I said before, they could be a fire pattern for the origin of the fire, but it, it could also be just the, the fuel that's in that area that causes this kind of burning to happen fuel being the combustibles like components and the seat cushion and such. Okay, cool. Next question. How can you determine that the arc, the wire arcing is not the original cause of the fire rather than arcing that was caused due to the fire spread? Well, that's a very good question. And that that is something that we always have to consider in a fire scene and, and doing a fire scene that's got to energize electrical circuits. So as you can see, in a typical fire scene, we'll probably get more than one area of arcing. Now, let's say in a typical room, you might get two, three, four, up to a dozen areas of arcing. Now, one of those areas of arcing could be the cause of the fire. So that is one of the steps in your arc map survey and later on in your cause determination where you have to think of uh, all those areas of arcing, are those potentially a cause arcing? Um, initially, during your origin determination, you're, you're not thinking cause, you're just thinking origin. So you're using those arc sites to help you determine the origin of the, of the fire. Now, when we went to this area, this, uh, just based on location, this one's downstream on, on the circuit. So this one would have arc severed and stopped the flow of electricity down below here uh, before this, this uh, happened, before this fire happened. So that tells me based on the principles of arc mapping, we actually removed the electricity from this cable uh, later on in the fire by the arcing at the top. So this arcing uh, in here, or this failure, happened first. Um, it, just going back, I'm not sure if I answered the question, but uh, we do have to consider all the arcing locations as a potential cause, but that comes later on in the cause determination. Cool. I've got a kind of a follow-up. Does an arc caused by fire consuming energized wiring look different than an arc that's actually caused that's caused a fire, for example, by a rodent chewing the sheathing? Well, that's another good question. So when you look at when you look at this, uh, you can see all the little beads. So that's telling me. I had multiple arcing areas here. So when this was failing, you're getting sputtering of sparks and heat and all, all sorts of uh, molten copper and molten aluminum being flown in all sorts of directions. This is, tell, this is telling me that this is arcing through char. Uh, and what that means is as the fire's attacking this cable, it's charring the cable and that char becomes conductive. And when that char becomes conductive, it conducts the electricity, and that's when your failure happens in the cable. If this was a causal arc, I wouldn't typically I wouldn't expect all that arcing to 
all these little beads to be here, I would expect one simple arc, one simple break, and that would be, but there's some people that, that will criticize that as, you know, you can't really do that, but sort of a, as a guide, if you have these these multiple pieces of arcing, that's more causal arcing rather, sorry, causal, that's more fire spread arcing as, as opposed to causal arcing. Causal arcing, you might have just this one split between two wires where it becomes disconnected at the breaker and then no more arcings occurring. Cool. A ton of, email, a ton of um, uh, questions are coming in. Uh, next question. Do you have any examples of x-rays which determine if an appliance has caused the loss? I do, but I don't have them handy here. So when you have an appliance that you have to x-ray, and typically we x-ray an appliance uh, in a non it's a non-destructive way of looking inside the appliance before we we put a manufacturer on notice. Um, so and before we you know bring in other experts, let's say on behalf of the manufacturer. Um, so what we would see in the appliance is we would see uh, when you x-ray something like this, you're going to see dark lines where the conductors are. You're going to see these balls, balls on the wires. So you will see that inside the appliance. And you will see the separation of wire, uh, the loss of material. You're going to see the balls. You're going to see the beads on the wires without even taking that appliance apart. What we'll do x-rays of appliances as well where the appliance maybe has melted on itself and all the plastic melted around the wires and that's going to make it harder for us to see all the exposed wires inside the appliance so that's another good tool to look inside the appliance and and sort of as a first look at a potential uh, of the appliance being the potential cause of the fire cool uh We've got two more minutes. Let's try to get through as many as we can. Can arc mapping be completed in a uh, much smaller area, such as an industrial dryer with numerous electrical connections to determine cause? Yes, most certainly. So uh, I, I mentioned that at the uh, prior to discussing my limitations that arc mapping can be also done inside of appliances and inside of vehicles, both much smaller than the the structure fires that I showed. And uh, arc mapping is actually an excellent tool, let's say within a dryer, because the dryer's got wiring that's sort of in the back of the dryer, on top of the dryer, uh, at the bottom of the dryer where the motor's located um, and uh, where the, where the uh, heating coils are located. So comparing that to the wiring diagram, um, you can say, uh, if there's arcing present, you can actually say, yes, that that dryer was running at the time of the fire if if there's arcing on wires that are not typically energized when the, when the dryer is not running. And you can also, based on the location of our arcing, let's say there's arcing along a cord within the dryer and there's multiple areas of arcing, you can say this arcing happened before this arcing because this arcing was upstream of the power source and therefore the downstream arcing happened first. The upstream arcing, if if it arc severed, happened second. So again, using those tools and, and using the predictable behavior of arcing, you, you can say where the fire was first and within that appliance. That's awesome. So we have hit the time, uh, or time's up. I'd love to get through all of them uh, live, but we will get to all of answering all of your questions just by email. Once we've concluded this, I'm going to send you guys a, a personal email, whoever submitted questions. Before you close this window, you can send those questions in to make sure that you get a response. Uh, thank you very much, Val, for joining us. Thank you all for joining us. We hope you stay safe and have a great day. Thanks, George. Thanks, everyone, for joining. Thank you, Val.